Jeremiah chapter 14. <clears throat> uh, again, my hope is, is that as we read God's word here, that we receive it in its context and in the spirit and truth that it's given. <clears throat> this coming Sunday, I will be giving a special message on what truth is. You remember Jesus standing before Pilate and Pilate said, what is truth? And so I'm gonna talk about that this coming Sunday. What is truth? Because it's important that we understand what truth is. If you are a believer in Christ Jesus, you, all you want is his truth and nothing else. Everything else, just cast every, newspaper, magazines, books, throw them out. You know, now I'm not saying literally throw them out. I'm saying they're less important than God's word is truth. And so we're going to talk about that. And it's important that we understand it because I want you to understand that what I love about Calvary Chapel, and I haven't been to another church as far as attending a Baptist or Pentecostal or Lutheran or, you know, I've been to Catholic and I see how dead that is as, as I was there. Very dead. The word's not even taught whatsoever. <clears throat> um, but what I love about Calvary Chapel is it just goes through the word. You pick a book and you go by book, by chapter, by verse, and you just cover that. Whether it's a running commentary and, and you're careful to, to interpret it in its context so that we're getting what God is saying to us as individuals. That's so important. And so you can't err from that, right? You, you can't. Uh, you're not going to err when you're reading the whole book. When you're reading in Genesis and then going all the way through Revelation, you, you, you're going to find the truth because you're seeking that truth. And so that's what I love about Calvary Chapel. What I love about the fact that I am a Calvary Chapel pastor is, is that I can do the same thing. That I can pick a book like we're in Jeremiah and I can go through each chapter and just give a running commentary as we go through in its context. And we know the context of Jeremiah, at least the first 46 verses or so are, I'm sorry, 45 chapters are really um, Jeremiah's prophecies concerning Judah. And so that's the context as he prophesies uh, concerning Judah and what's going on because of their idolatry. We know that to be the context. And so we have to interpret everything in light of that. In light of their sin, in light of the fact that God is judging them, in light of the fact that God is going to take them and, and put them into captivity of Babylon. <clears throat> so I, I love it because, and this is where it gets a, a, a little touchy, because in the past I have been accused of preaching at someone. What do I mean by that? Well, once in a while, someone will come up to me and say, who's talking to you? Because everything you said is going on in my life right now. And my response to that person and that person that I'm thinking of right now was nobody. <laughs> Why? What are you, what's going on? He says, well, the message that you gave has just hit every single point that's going on in my life. And you're talking to somebody because how would you know that? You know. And I didn't. That's the Holy Spirit. Now, to be honest with you too, this is a small church and a lot of people come to me for counseling and a lot of people tell me their situations. And so there are times when I'm going through the word and those situations come up. They're in the word. As a Calvary Chapel pastor, I don't just go, oops, and I throw it out the, out the side. I have to teach it because it's in the context as I'm teaching and who knows if God has not brought it up at that moment to correct you or encourage you or strengthen you. Who knows that God isn't ministering to you? And then I've had the remark, you know, you offended someone. There's enough in the word of God to offend everybody. I get offended by the word of God. And so, yeah, I'm going to offend someone. I'll offend someone tonight. I'm sure I will. But it's not me offending anyone. It's the word of God offending you and what you're going through in your life. And God is trying to minister to you. So I take comfort knowing that I can just go through the Bible. And yeah, there are going to be things that, that I can kind of connect some faces to what's going on here. You know, 
But there are other things that I can't connect, but God is still ministering to you. Your responsibility as a church is to receive the word of God, the truth, no matter how it's preached, no matter how it's said. Is it true and have I received it? I want you to consider that because you're a believer in Christ Jesus. And and as a believer, we want to know truth. We want truth in our life because we want to please God, right? Uh, We were were studying Monday night uh, on singles. And you remember in in Acts chapter 7, Paul said, uh, the unmarried uh, have a greater opportunity than those that are married because they can what? They can focus on the things of the Lord and what pleases him. And I mentioned that, that statement uh, to everyone Monday night, and I kind of asked the question, is that scripture verse correct? Is it correct? If you're unmarried, you are to focus on the things of the Lord and what pleases him. Is that a correct statement? And I could see some of the heads going, you know, they didn't, they didn't know. They didn't know. Now, They didn't know because they didn't understand the question that I was asking. See, according to the Bible, from God's perspective, a born-again believer who is unmarried will focus his life on the Lord and the things that please him. That's the proper context. Now, is that true for every individual? Well, no, of course not. And that's what they were thinking. Well, no, it's not because I don't see it in people's lives. I don't see it in singles. I don't even see it in married couples. You know, Paul even said married, act as though you're not married. In other words, you know, don't spend so much time together, but get busy with the things of the Lord and what pleases the Lord. So, so my, my point there is this. As a believer, our desire should be to please the Lord. What is it that pleases God? How can we please God? How can I change my life to please you? Because in reality, when we give our lives to the Lord, he becomes our master. And so we kind of step aside and say, lead us now, Lord. I don't want to lead my life anymore because I know where I was leading it before. (laughs) It wasn't good. And so now you lead it and I will just follow. That's why Jesus said, a man doesn't take his hands to the plow and then looks back. He's not worthy for the kingdom of God. And, and, and so the, the analogy, the picture there is when you take the plow of letting God lead you, because that horse will lead you to plow, you're not leading it, you're not guiding it, he's guiding you. Yeah, you're directing it, but God is guiding us. That's the point. And if you look back, he says, then you're not worthy because you want to lead your own life. No, yes, it's true. <clears throat> As believers, we want to please the Lord. And I hope that you'll at least consider that as we go through uh, this chapter here. And there's so much here that um, is just amazing. Now, some of you have probably heard this phrase. When your mother says, wait till your father gets home. What are you expecting when you hear that phrase? A good whipping, right? My mom would say that. My dad worked graveyards and never saw him during the week. Saturday morning after he woke up, we saw him. And that was usually Saturday morning whipping time, you know, to catch up for what we've done during the week. And so she would say that often, I'm going to tell your dad. And so we got away with it a lot until Saturday morning. And he'd pull out the belt or the fan belt and just, you know, give us our, our due, you know, because judgment was coming, in other words. And that's my point. That's my point here. The signs of God's judgment are all around us. You just see it. You see what's going on in the world today and you go, man, God's going to judge the world. I was listening to Dave Rolfe and, and um, the pastor pers- perspective, Brian Broderson and some others that were on there. And they were talking about the end times and they were talking about how we need to be careful uh, that we're not, uh, we're not making a prediction that the Lord is going to come real soon. In a sense, hard fact because we really don't know is their point. He, he could come back in 10 years from now or 20 years from now or 100 years from now. That's a possibility. You know, we really don't know, and he said we don't know. Uh, he, Jesus even said he didn't know. And so their point was this, is that we don't know, and so we need to be careful that we don't somehow present it as though we know that he's coming back like tomorrow, because he may not. And, and I agree to that to a certain extent, 
Um, but I also think that as you look at the signs, and not just, you know, they were giving examples like wars. There have been some horrific wars in this world besides what's going on in our world today. Uh, Rich at the men's study talked about the French and how they went through war. They beheaded more people than ISIS has ever beheaded during that time. And so when you hear things like that, that there were more horrific wars, even fam- famines. You know, we, we've heard of pestilence go through and kill hundreds of thousands of people, the Black Plague, you know, things like this. And so, um, you know, yeah, that, that makes sense. You know, that, yeah, God could not come back or possibly may not come back. But when you think of everything, pestilence and earthquakes and famines and, and then Israel becoming a nation and then just all of it together, you think we're that much closer, though. We definitely are, are that much closer. So the signs are there. Kind of like Costco. You know, I went to Costco the other day to get supplies for the church. And as I was going down the aisles, all of a sudden I saw the wrapping paper and I saw the, the lights and I saw gifts and toys. And you know what I thought in my head? Christmas is coming. Christmas is coming. Well, how close are we to Christmas? We're like almost two months away. But I know Christmas is coming because they have everything out. And so in the same way, we know the end's coming because we see the signs of what's going on in the world today. And so Jeremiah is, is, is really giving us his overview here of the prophecies concerning Judah and the judgment upon Judah in chapters 2 through 45. Now, during... During this time that uh, Jeremiah is talking about Judah, there was a time where there was a famine and the cisterns uh, had no water. So let's go ahead and read verse 1. The word of the Lord that came to Jeremiah concerning the droughts. The droughts. Now, droughts and famines weren't new to Israel. They knew that uh, there were times of droughts. In fact, um, there were limited places where you could stay, right? I mean, you live in a desert, and so the only places that you could really stay were usually by mountain ranges where there were streams running, and so that's where, where the population kind of habited themselves because of the lack of water in other places. And those that went out into the deserts had to find ways of, of getting waters, and so they would create ways of, of retaining water. And when droughts came, there was a lack of water, and so when Israel saw that a drought was coming, they knew that it was more than just nature. They knew that God was sending them a message. And that message was, you've done something wrong and you need to correct yourself. Because droughts were known to come when God's judgment came. In Deuteronomy 11, it says, if they do not obey, the Lord will send drought. If they don't obey. And there's that concept again that we were talking about, the curses and blessings uh, of Israel. If you obey my word, I'll bless you. And if you don't obey my word, I will curse you. Does that still hold true for us today? Whatever a man sows, that shall he also reap. I guarantee you that truth is still true today. That principle is true. If we disobey God's word, if we live our lives in a rebellious way, God isn't going to bless you. I don't care how deceived you are, God will not bless you. He's not going to bless you. He's not going to bless the the, the works of your hands. He's not going to bless your business. He's not going to bless your life. He's not going to bless your ventures because you've got some disobedience that you need to take care of. And he wants you to be obedient first. So yes, that is true. Deuteronomy 28, the Lord will strike you with drought. And we see it throughout the scriptures. Haggai uh, chapter 1, he actually called for a drought upon the people. Amos did the same thing, that God sent a drought on some of the towns that were there. Elijah, you remember Elijah? Called that it would rain no more. And then it rained again when he called it to rain. And so Jeremiah is dealing in this chapter with a drought and concerning droughts. He'll deal with it again in Jeremiah chapter 50. And it says in verse 2, Judah mourns. Yeah, there's no water. If you can imagine what that means for you, I mean, how long can you survive without water? Not very long. How long can your animals survive? How long can your crops survive? Not very long. And her gates languish. They mourn for the land. So uh, the gates languishing 
uh, is signifying where they met together as judges, this was city hall and so forth. And the talk of the, the day was there's no water. We're in a drought, just kind of like California today, right? Everybody's supposed to conserve. Uh, there's debate whether that's happening really in California or not. They're saying we have plenty of water and it's just another way of you know, hiking up the rates. And so that was the talk of the day, the drought. And so they mourned in the land and the cry of Jerusalem was, has gone up. Their nobles have set their lads, uh, sent their lads for water and they went to the cisterns and found no water. Now we're going to talk about cisterns here in a minute. But they sent their young men to go get water. Now, you'll notice some things here because they find that it's empty. They return with their vessels empty. They were ashamed. Why would they be ashamed if there was a drought? That's my question. And confounded. Why would they be confounded? Okay, well, I don't understand why this drought is happening. This is a little strange. Uh, I'm a little confounded by that. But why would you be ashamed uh, and then they covered their heads. Why would you cover your heads? Covering your head at that time signified humility, shamefulness, you know, that they've done something wrong and so I'm kind of hiding myself. Uh, usually when someone knows that they're wrong, uh, one of the signs that they know that something's wrong, they may not admit it, but is they usually do this. They'll drop their head a little bit because they know in shame they've done something wrong. And so in a sense, they've covered themselves. Why? Because the ground is parched. For there was no rain in the land. The plowmen were ashamed. So even the workers, the, the ones that were out there in the field and attending the vineyards and, and the wheat harvests and so forth, they were also ashamed and they covered their heads. Yes, the deers also gave birth in the field, but left because there was no grass. So it's affecting the animals. The wild donkeys stood in the desolate heights. They sniffed at the wind like jackals. In other words, they're, they're, they're sniffing to see if there's any moisture in the air, any, any smell of water nearby that they would go and, and find it like jackals. You know, they're looking for food and they're sniffing to find anything dead that they could just go and scarf up. And their eyes fail because there was no grass. So it seems here that the sin of Judah also affected the agricultural economy. Hmm. If that's true, then does a sin of a nation affect the agricultural economy for today? Does a sin of a nation cause disasters to come on the world? I would say, yeah. But I would not say that this disaster was caused because of sin, because I don't know. Uh, that's one of those questions that you can say, yeah, God has done that in the past, He's even done it during the time of the New Testament. But is this situation, Katrina, was that caused because of the sin of a nation? A lot of people would say, yeah. Others would say, I don't know. And those are the type of questions that you wait when you get to heaven. You ask God, well, so was that because of sin? And he's like, yeah, or no. You know, who knows? But the possibility is there. And we see it here. Now, a cistern is a Hebrew word that means hole or pit. Uh, often it's used as well, but there's a difference between a well and a cistern. A well, usually you dig a hole and water, you hit the water table and then the water starts to, to come up and now you have water available to you. Where a cistern is more of, a, and before the 13 BC, they usually had bottle type of cisterns that they put in the ground and very small and they weren't really advanced. The water would, would seep into the cistern, but it wouldn't stay there very long because it would seep out into the ground into the earth and the sides and so forth. And it wasn't until after the 1300s BC that they decided to plaster the walls. And that kept the water in the cistern. Now that tells me something interesting spiritually. We are to be filled with the Spirit. Continually be filled with the Spirit. We are to hear what God is saying in Revelation, you see that those who have an ear, let them hear. And the, the meaning there is not hear and forget. The meaning is let, it, let them hear and then let them bring it here into their hearts and then let it change them. Let them be warned in, in a sense. These are warnings. That's what 
Paul told us in Corinthians that those things in the Old Testament are warnings for, they're examples for us that we don't follow them. And so if we are to be filled with the Holy Spirit, if we're to be taking in the word of God, if we are to be changing, then we are to retain it and not just let it come in one year and out the other. So my dad used to always say, he'd always have these little sayings, you know, be like the ant, not the grasshopper. And we're like little kids, okay, dad. What do you mean, ant? Then he'd have to explain it. Ants store up food for the winter. Grasshoppers eat and they go and die. Or he'd say, you know, you guys are like the three little monkeys. Monkey see, monkey do, you know, and that type, I don't forget what the other monkey was. And we're like, okay, dad, now, wh- what, is, what does that mean? You know, he had that one saying, you know, it goes in one ear and it comes out the other. You know, we didn't understand that one either. And then he explained it to us. It comes in here, you hear me, but you just throw it out the other end and you don't do anything about it. And that's sometimes how we take the word of God. I take it like that sometimes. I'll go to pastor's conferences and I'll listen to the teacher and it's a great message and it goes in one ear and I'm thinking, yeah, and then all of a sudden it goes out the other. And then sometimes there's those teachers that just, whoo, they, they, they grab your attention. It makes sense. It goes in your ear and you're saying, yeah, I need to do that. You know? And that's what we need to do with the word of God. We are, in a sense, cisterns. We're not broken cisterns. Yet we are broken cisterns. We need to allow the word of God to stay in us, the Holy Spirit to stay in us and take it seriously that what God has written down in his word is for us to apply to our hearts so that we can live a prosperous life. The cisterns of Palestine was usually a bottled pear-shaped reservoir that held the water and sometimes they'd even make covers for it so that the debris didn't fall down into it. When I was in Israel... I actually got to walk down the stairs into a cistern and they would they would create stairs along the side of it, kind of going around it so you can get down there and clean up whatever water, but also to get the water that's, you know, down at the bottom because you're using it up and so forth. So it's a it's a neat neat little place and it's probably about twice as big as this building and probably twice as deep. So it holds a lot of water. And so you could go to the desert build a cistern and fill it with water but there was a drought in the land now cisterns in the scriptures can speak of different things sometimes they would hold water in joseph's uh situation genesis 37 you remember that his brothers put him in a cistern to hold until he was sold to a group of uh, men going by in jeremiah's time they literally used a cistern to imprison him to keep him there. Zedekiah's son put Jeremiah there. <clears throat> and in, Jer- in Jeremiah 14 here, the pagan gods were symbols or symbolized as broken cisterns who could not hold water. So Jeremiah's point here is that you have false teachers, you have these, these people that worship pagan gods, and re- in reality, it's going in one ear and out the other. They're not holding anything at all so look at verse 7 as the lord says do not forsake us as they say or jeremiah says do not forsake us O lord though through through our iniquities testify against us do it for your name's sake for our backsliding are many we have sinned against you now i found that interesting you can highlight in that in your bible if you'd like to but we have sinned against you it's uncertain whether Jeremiah said this as a confession on his behalf or whether he was pleading on the people's behalf. It doesn't really say. I have the idea that it was for the people's behalf that he was praying this, that you know our iniquity, but for your name's sake, we pray that you will forgive them because we have sinned against you. And I like that phrase we have sinned against you they have back, backslidden they had fallen away they had worship idols <clears throat> they had gone into idolatry and fornication and all kinds of sexual immorality and and so forth and yet jeremiah says we have sinned against you so there's a truth there that when we sin 
we sin against God. Because all sin is against God. If you sin against, if you think you sin against your brother, which you do, you can harm him or hurt him in some way or fashion, or even his, his character, his name, but yet you sin against God because that person is also a child of God and you have no right to sin against a child of God because God has purchased them with his very blood. So you notice that Jeremiah prays, our backsliding are many, he says, and really a true man or woman of God doesn't just point the finger at someone else. They always point the finger at themselves. We have sinned against you, Jeremiah said. We. It's not just one person. We have all sinned against the Lord. And that's taking responsibility, isn't it? That's saying, I agree with you, God. I have sinned against you. We have all sinned against you. We've all fallen short of your glory. We've not measured up to your way. I find that um, in my relationship with my wife, whether she starts it or I start it, I'm going to fit, no, I'm sorry. (laughs) I find that we have sinned. It doesn't matter who starts it. The tendency is once it started is we begin to both sin. We begin to both sin. That is usually reality, right? Because the way we respond or the way that we react to someone who initiates something can also be sin. And so we really need to trust God, have faith in him, receive it, and not sin. That's our responsibility. Does that happen? No. Even in ministry, even when there's struggles in ministry, and things are brought to our attention, our response to that at times can become sinful because it's an attitude of the heart. The anger, the frustration, those are all signs of uh, lack of trust in God. There was a question that was uh, asked Chuck, and and I keep hearing this over and over again. And the question was asked Chuck was, so what do you think the future of Calvary Chapel is? This was when he was alive. He says, what do you think the future for Calvary Chapel is? And Chuck said this, God started Calvary Chapel. And if God wants to finish Calvary Chapel, that's his business. I just stay faithful with what God has given me to do. Now that's a man of faith. That's a man that understands he's not in control and that he leaves it in God's hands. That is the only way that you can deal with these situations without sinning, without sinning. <clears throat> I heard a story today, which I thought was pretty good. We were talking about Pastor Chuck actually a couple of days ago, <clears throat> and um, this individual said about Chuck, we're hearing a lot of stories about him, but Chuck had given them this book, uh, Why Grace Changes Things. And they read it and it was sitting in their office and Chuck went and visited them and, you know, sitting down and talking with them and so forth. And this is from the individual's perspective. And he just thought to himself at the time, Chuck's here, the book's there. So he grabbed the book and he said, Pastor Chuck, would you sign this for me? And he said, that was a mistake. That was the biggest mistake. I remember that to this day, the look on his face and he said that it was a look of like, I thought we were friends. Because you see, Chuck wasn't into signing and getting his name in books and, and trying to lift himself up and make himself popular. He didn't care about that stuff. And he felt offended. Why would you even ask me that? Who am I to sign your book? Now, if you would have said it was a good read, hey, I'd receive that. You know, but that was Chuck. He could just... Whoop, And say, God's in control. I leave it in his hands. He could easily deal with situations when someone would come up and say, Hey, Chuck, I got a question for you. And the guy's heated up, you know. And and he says something like, Is there a rock big enough that God couldn't lift? 
And Chuck would realize that obviously this person isn't seeking truth and he'd just walk away. Because he's not going to waste his time on a person that's not seeking truth. He totally understood that. Totally understood that. But you come to him with a sincere heart and really wanting to know truth, he'd spend all the time that you needed until you understood it. Because he was a man of God. And it's just amazing. It's amazing. Now there's a great example for us to follow. See, a a person that knows the Lord will say, we have sinned. We have sinned. I have sinned against you, Lord. It's used so many times. uh, Genesis 20 and how I have sinned against you, O Lord. Exodus ten sixteen. I have sinned against the Lord. Numbers thirty two twenty three. I have sinned against the Lord. Deuteronomy one forty one. We have sinned against the Lord. Sinned against the Lord your God. Deuteronomy nine. It's all over the place. We're all responsible. He goes on, O the hope of Israel, his Savior in time of trouble, why should you be like a stranger in the land and like a traveler who turns aside to tarry for the night? Why should you be like a man astonished, like a mighty one who cannot save? Yet you, O Lord, are in our midst and we are called by your name. Do not leave us. Now, they thought, well, if we can't, ask you to forgive us on our behalf in our confession then do it because of your namesake because you're good and you don't want your name blemish and they made a mistake they were approaching him like he cared about their situation and he didn't let me explain that he wanted repentance he didn't want to just fix their problem and give them water. He wanted them to approach him with repentance, not sorriness, but repentance, and turn from their sin back to the Lord in the right way. And he wanted that change. And so they believed that they could call on him, and he would just say, oh, okay, just because you're calling on me. No, it doesn't work that way. So he says, I will destroy them with the sword and famine. Thus says the Lord, verse 10, to his people, thus they have love to wander. They have love to wander. They love to wander. The tendency of a heart is to wander, to stray away, to seek after its own way. And, and we've noticed that with, Israel, with Judah here, haven't we? A lot of it is that. They're doing their own thing. They're going their own way, making their own plans And so here he says, you have a tendency to wonder and you love to wonder. They have not restrained their feet. Therefore, the Lord does not accept them. And so you have this picture of them not really repenting, but desiring and hungering after those things. You know, the Bible says if if you ask the Lord in his name anything, it says he'll give it to you. Now think about that scripture verse there for a second. So really, are you saying if I ask the Lord for anything, he'll give it to me? Most people approach it that way. And so you get these faith movements. Oh, so if I want riches, God's going to give me rich. If I want a Cadillac, God's going to give me a Cadillac. You know, no, that's not what he's saying though. Again, in the context of a spirit-filled person who loves the Lord, he is not going to ask for something that is not in the will of the Lord. And so when he asks, it will be in the will of the Lord that he asks, and the Lord says, I hear you and I'll give it to you, because you're asking with the right heart, not with the wrong motive. These people love to wonder, and they did not restrain their feet. Wonder from the things of the Lord. Wonder from God himself. Wander from the Ten Commandments. Wander from His Word. Wander from the fellowship in the temple of God. Wander in the fellowship of one another, of accountability. They have a tendency to wander and not restrain their feet. Therefore, the Lord does not accept them. He will remember their iniquity now and punish their sin. Then the Lord said to me, Do not pray for this people for their good. Don't pray for them. Wow. Why? Because their hearts, their hearts are hardened. 
You know, and I think the only prayer that God would hear is, Lord, crush their hearts that they would turn to you. Bring them to a point that they would cry out to you. That's really where God wants all of us. Let's learn from this example here in this chapter. See, God wants us crushed before him at all times. He wants us sensitive to his spirit and to his ways so that we can be used by him for his purpose, to fulfill his plan for our lives. That's where he wants us, that he could pour his love upon us, as Jude says. If we keep ourselves under the love of God, he will continue to pour that love. It says, when they fast, I will not hear their cry. And when they offer burnt offering and grain offering, I will not accept them. But I will consume them by the sword, by the famine, and by the pestilence. Now, obviously, they're, they're praying, they're fasting, they're offering up their sacrifices because they, they want water in the land. They want to be blessed. They want to see God working again. Kind of sounds familiar, doesn't it? In Revelation, we, we get the same picture, Revelation 6, 6, 8, about the pale horse. Remember the pale horse? The name of him who sat on it was death and Hades followed with him and power was given to them over a fourth of the earth to kill with the sword, with hunger, with death and by the beast of the earth. And there'll be another time when God deals with the children of Israel again because they have rejected him and he would draw them back to himself. Verse 13, then I, that is Jeremiah said, Ah, Lord God, behold, the prophets say to them. Now, these were prophets that Judah had raised up within their community that were at the gates. These were prophets that were supposed to represent God. They were supposed to give them the truth. These are, these are, these are supposed to be the pastors of the churches. These are supposed to be the Christians within the community and the assembling of one another. These are the prophets. These are the teachers. These are the men who are to give wisdom, God's wisdom. That's what they're supposed to do. But notice these prophets. They say, you shall not see the sword, nor shall you have famine, but I will give you assurance, peace, peace. In this place, these prophets were prophesying falsely. These prophets weren't telling the truth. These prophets were lying. These prophets were disseminating not wisdom, but destruction upon them. These prophets were to be in the assemblies, helping people to draw them closer to Christ and not pull them away from Christ. No, these prophets were liars. These prophets were deceivers. These prophets were giving their worldly counsel and their worldly wisdom and their worldly insights to situations instead of the word of God. And so they were getting conflicting stories from these false prophets. You ever get a conflicting story? Boy, I hate that. I, uh, it's so frustrating You have a situation, you want to do the right thing, you want to please God, so you go to somebody, hey, what do you think about this? And they tell you what they think. And then you go to someone else, hey, what do you think about this? And they tell you, ah, that's worse now. Now I've got three opinions, you know, because now there's mine, theirs, and and his, you know. It's like, okay, Lord, what do I do here? And you've got to read the word. You've got to study the word. You've got to go to the word. And then you've got to ask yourself, okay, who am I going to? What kind of prophet is he? Is he? Is he a pastor? Is he a pastor? <clears throat> At our meeting yesterday, uh, one of the pastors, uh, I'm not going to use his name, um, he was saying t- to us other pastors, he says, you have these people in your churches too. And sometimes they'll come up to you and, and they're really upset at you. Um, he said that, it, that he was talking about, well, Veterans Day. And he shared uh, a little pamphlet that they received. And in the pamphlet, it said that these men died for our freedom. And in fact, uh, these men have died and given their lives even to free us to burn, f- burn flags. And he said, and someone stood up and walked right out the door. They were so mad because they misunderstood him. They thought he meant it's okay to burn flags. That's not what he said. That's not what he said at all, but they misunderstood him. He says, you have people like that in your church. He says, and then you have people that will come up to you and they're angry and they're mad and they'll say, how can you say that? That is so wrong. 
And he said, I usually stop him there and said, let me ask you a question. How much Bible reading do you do? Well, that's not the point. Well, this is my call. <laughs> this is what I do for a living. I study the word of God every single day. I dissect it. And you're going to come to me, a once in a while reader, and tell me that this isn't right? No, you're not right, and I'm right. And isn't that true? That's amazing because it happens all the time how people will come up to me, you know, and they're going to direct me and so forth. And then I'm looking at them, and you don't even have a study life. I probably, you probably never even studied the Bible. Yeah, maybe you've had a devotion here and there. But they presume to tell you the way it should be when they haven't even read through the whole counsel of God. Conflicting stories. We need to be in the word of God and we need to know who we're going to. We need to know that it's a pastor. We need to know it's an elder. We, know, we need to know that it's a person that's studying and teaching the word of God and simply the word of God and nothing else. And that's the person that you can trust. See, a true prophet will, will teach the righteousness of God's word. He will only teach that. A false prophets are given a large measure of blame for Jerusalem's tragedy here for having given the people false and empty assurances of Jerusalem's security. And so they're depending on these false prophets who were worthless in, in, in a sense. Their theology contained an element of truth and there's always an element of truth there, but it was completely flawed. It ignored the fact that God's blessings were conditional on the people, Deuteronomy went over that. If you keep my commandments, I'll bless you. If you don't, I will curse you. And they ignored that completely. They were living in sin and they thought, God will bless me. No, he won't. He will not bless you as you're living in sin. I'm sorry. You're deceived if you think God's going to bless you if you're living in sin. It just won't happen. I guarantee you it will not happen. He will not let you get away with it because he's a righteous and pure and holy God. And he will correct you. In fact, you will go through things. Mark my words. If you are in rebelliousness against God, you will go through things. I guarantee it because he loves you. That's the whole purpose of it all because he loves you and wants to draw you back unto himself. And that's why you go through those things. I've been through them. I know, it, I know by first-hand experience that if you try to get away with something, God won't let you. Believe me, he will not let you. He's true to his word. If the false prophets had exposed the people's sin and warned them of consequences, the calamity could have been avoided, Right? If they would have done their job and said, look, you're sinning, stop it, turn back to the Lord and he'll bless you, they would have done their job. And if they would have listened and done it, they would be blessed until this day. But they were getting those conflicting messages. Be careful. Be careful where you're getting your advice. I would never take the advice of somebody, and I'm just being honest with you, that has not read through the word of God. That would probably be one of my first questions. Have you read through the Word of God? Okay, thank you. Move on. You need somebody that has a spiritual insight to God's Word that will be honest in love because they desire to see you walking with the Lord in prosperity with Him. He goes on, And the Lord said to me, The prophets prophesy lies in my name. They even use the name of the Lord. That, that's amazing. You know, and it still happens today. <clears throat> oh, God told me that. You know, God said this. You know. Again, like I shared with you years ago about the, the, the young lady who <clears throat> they were struggling in their marriage and, and she had a ministry to the youth, you know. And usually in most cases with, with marriages, usually somebody's got someone else on the side. That's usually the case when they're starting to get into trouble. And this person definitely had someone on the side. And they basically came up and says, I need some prayer because God's leading me to divorce my husband and marry someone else. I'm like, no, you don't need prayer. You need to repent. You know, God would never lead you to do that. That's a lie of the enemy. Oh, no, I prayed about it. He wants me to be happy. Well, that's Joel Osteen's wife. 
She's the one who says, be happy in all those situations. You know, God just wants you happy no matter what. <clears throat> That's a lie. That's why they're false prophets. Actually, they're not even prophets. They're motivational speakers. They prophesy lies. They, they lie, they lie, they lie. You know, I think sometimes people don't intentionally lie. I think the enemy uses them to lie. <laughs> you know, he, they're, they're under his hand and they don't even know it. You know, no, go read your Bible for a few years. Go study it a little bit. Go, go, you know, I really encourage you all to go to some conferences. Go to some conferences and hear some good Bible teaching. Uh, we just went to expositorial preaching. That would have been a great conference to go to if you want to study the Word of God and get it within its context. It was, gr- it was awesome. Fausto and I went. It was great. really gets you to see the Word and what it's saying and the main point. Do that first before you, you start speaking for God. Um, a lay person needs to be careful. You know, they need to probably preface it with, you know, I don't know the whole Bible, you know, this is what I think, but please don't listen to me. And that's a good way to do it because now you're not responsible because you will be responsible for every word that comes out of your mouth. God said that. Every word that comes out of your mouth, you'll be held accountable for it. And so be careful. I have not sent them. Now that's interesting. That's interesting. God said he didn't send them. They're not of me. Galatians chapter 5 talks about the works of the flesh and how these works of the flesh will not inherit the kingdom of God. One of the works of the flesh is heresy. Heresy is false teaching, false prophesying, false direction. How many people on TBN are giving false heresy? There's a, a Bahama pastor just passed away, him and his wife and a couple of the couples. They were on their way to a conference in a plane and as they were coming to land, there was this huge crane and they hit the crane. They all died. <clears throat> he was the guy. <coughs> Years ago, I'm watching him on TBN. He was a guy that said that Jesus Christ was an African American. Now, I don't know. I don't know if he was or not. It doesn't say. But then he brings out an African-American on a cross and starts displaying it. And here's the falsehood of all. It was him on the cross. It was his own image. He goes, and in a sense, he's saying that Jesus' death and work wasn't needed. I could have done that myself. False prophet. Did he get judged? I don't know, but interesting, interesting, interesting. I haven't sent them, God said. I haven't sent them at all. There are false prophets out there. Be careful. Um, Christianity, let me be very clear. Christianity is the only way to heaven. I'm going to make that clear. I may offend some of you. All of the religions, all of our faiths are false. Jesus said, I am the way. I am the truth and I am the life and no one can get to the Father except through me, John 6, 14 or 14, 6. That's it. Every other way is seeking sand. It's false. How can you say that? Because Jesus said it. Because the word of God has said it. That there's only one way. Jesus said, narrow is the way to eternal life. Broad is the way to destruction. Let me define that a little bit more so you understand. Christianity is the oldest religion. No, wait a minute, what are you talking about? No, it's not. It was when Christ came. No, it it was when God created Adam and Eve. That's when it begun. It didn't have the name Christianity, but God has always been the God that we serve back then. It's the same God yesterday, today, and tomorrow believing the same thing. You see the cross and crucifixion of Christ right there in Genesis chapter 3 when God says during the curse that he will raise up a man, a child, speaking of the Messiah, and the serpent will try to bite his heel, but you'll crush his head. It's talking about the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. So Christianity has been around the longest all of the faiths. 
are wrong. God has not sent them. Now, Greg Laurie is correct. Always, always lead to God. Always lead to God. Now, as everyone approaches God, some all will be judged who do not have Christ, and all who have Christ will not be judged. They all lead to him, but then they go from there to either separation from God for eternity or communion with God for eternity because he had not sent them, nor commanded them, nor spoke to them. They prophesied to you a false vision, divination, a worthless thing, and the deceit of their heart. It all stems from the heart. All from the heart. Matthew 7.22 says, Many will say to me in the last days, Lord, Lord, we have, not prophesied, have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, and done many wonders in your name? And what did Jesus say? Depart from me, workers of iniquity, I do not know you. I didn't send you. I didn't talk to you. I didn't tell you what to say. It's all lies. I think we need to be warned of that. Um, That's called apologetics. It's a defense for the faith. It's knowing what you believe and then knowing what others believe. And then comparing them to the truth of the word of God. We need to understand that. We need to define words. Because I, I say I believe in Christ, and then you can talk to a Catholic person that says, I believe in Christ, and then you can talk to a Scientology person and he says, I believe in Christ, and then you can talk even to a New Ager who says, I believe in Christ. You have to define what that means. Because to a New Ager, that means Christ is everything Christ is everywhere Christ is the chair Christ is the tree God is everything and I believe God is a God or she God you know is everywhere that's not the same Christ that I believe in it's a different Christ so you have to define words you have to get the definitions of what they are really saying to you Catholicism, yeah, they believe in Christ. He died on the cross. But they also believe that he dies every time they give you the communion. That's what the whole communion ceremony is about, the Eucharist and so forth. They're getting him and they're crucifying him over and over and over again. That's why they show him still on the cross. You notice that here he's not on a cross. We don't have a figure on the cross because Jesus is resurrected. He went to heaven. But in Catholicism... They have to crucify him again. And so the blood and the body. And they literally believe that the Eucharist and and the cup that has the wine turn into his body and his blood. And then we get to eat his body and drink his blood all over again, as he said we should do. There in John, I think chapter 8 or so. You have to define the words. What does it really mean? And then compare it to the word of God. The word of God tells us that that. Christ died once and for all. Then comes the judgment. That's it. Just one time. And he's not on the cross. He's not in the grave. He's sitting at the right hand of the Father. And he's waiting to come back again. That's what the Bible says. So anything other than that is false. He didn't send them. Therefore, thus says the Lord concerning the prophets who prophesy in my name, whom I did not send, and who say sword and famine shall not be in the land, By sword and famine, those prophets shall be consumed. So the thing that they said wouldn't happen will come upon them. Be careful that you're not a person giving the wrong information. Because maybe what you say will come upon you. I've seen that happen quite often. People that get divorces, they kind of congregate with other people that want to get divorces. So they all get divorces, you know, type of thing. Interesting how it all happens to all of them because they're prophesying that God wants them to do that. And the people to whom they prophesy shall be cast out in the streets of Jerusalem because of the famine and the sword. They will have no one to bury them. Uh, Amazing. They'll just be laying on the streets. It still happens today. You go to India, you go to some of these places, there's bodies all over the place. They have to come by and sweep them up. Sad. 
them nor their wives nor their sons nor their daughters for I will pour their wickedness on them. Then he goes on and says that uh, these idols are nothing. They can't even bring rain. Therefore you shall say this word to them. Let my eyes flow with tears night and day and let them not cease. For the virgin daughter of my people have, broke, have been broken with a mighty stroke, with a very severe blow. If I go out to the field, then behold those slain with the sword. And if I enter the city, and behold, those sick with fa- from famine, yes, both prophet and priests go about in the land, they do not know. Have you utterly rejected Judah? And this is asked by Jeremiah. He asked three questions. Have you utterly rejected them? Has your soul loathed Zion? Why have you stricken us so that there is no healing for us? So these are questions that he's asking. You remember in the earlier chapter, Jeremiah was like, because his family wanted to kill him, right? And so he was kind of like, Lord, kill him, get him. And now he's changing his mind. It's like, wait a minute, Lord. I mean, are you totally rejecting us? Are, are, do you loathe us or what's going on here? We look for peace, but there was no good. And for the time of healing and there was trouble. We acknowledge, O oh Lord, our wickedness and the iniquity of our fathers, for we have sinned against you. Do not abhor us for your name's sake. Do not disgrace the throne of your glory. Remember, do not break your covenant with us. Now, those are good things to call out on. Uh, please, Lord, we're really begging you. And this is Jeremiah doing it and really not the people doing it. And that's why I believe it's Jeremiah on behalf of the people who don't know better. I know that heart, you know, as a pastor and in my my prayer time, uh, as I was walking today, I, I call it walking and talking with God. This morning about 5.30, I was walking around the street and I was reading Matthew. We'll be in Matthew in a couple of weeks. <clears throat> and I was reading the first 17 verses. And, you know, it's all about the genealogy of Jesus and, you know, so-and-so begot, so-and-so, and so-and-so begot, so-and-so, and so-and-so begot, so-and-so. And I read that, and I'm like, wow, it's just the genealogy. And all these things came to my mind and so forth. And then all of a sudden, the Lord said, and it always ends with Jesus, right? And Jesus Christ. And ultimately, that was the end of the genealogy at his birth. And that's what it was leading to, that he was from the line of David. But you know, there's, there's a part that's not in there, but it's true. We see it in John chapter 1, verse 12. He gave us the right to become children of God. But there should be a line that says, and Christ begot us right? He begot you. You can put your name there. And Christ begot Reuben, and Christ begot Roman, and Christ begot Carlos, and Christ begot, you know, Christ begot you. Uh, That's so neat. That is so neat that Christ begot me, and Christ begot you. And I understand that heart of Jeremiah, you know, praying for the people, because that's what I do. I pour my heart out praying for this church for the people in the church for the things that they're going through and it's a cry to God to help to direct and guide to forgive and that was Jeremiah's heart Lord I've got three questions I mean are you totally going to just forget them are you totally you know neglecting them Lord what's going on and ultimately, you, you, you come to a point like, Lord, I mean, you know what's best for your church. You know what's best. And just help me, Lord, to somehow help as much as I can. Are there many, are there any among the idols, verse 22, of the nations that can cause rain? Or can the heavens give showers? Are you not he, O Lord our God? Therefore we will wait for you since you have made all these. And that's all you can do is wait on the Lord as a pastor to work in the lives of his people and to trust in him.